we'll be going over IRS Form 8867, Paid Preparer's Due Diligence Checklist. So most taxpayers will probably never have to complete this form unless they're a paid tax return preparer. Uh, but one thing that I noticed during this tax season w was uh, a couple things, actually. Uh, first, there were a lot of questions that I uh, answered either uh, on this channel or in the comments on our website or on uh, uh, various groups that I belong to, uh, specifically from taxpayers wondering why their tax return preparer was asking so many questions and requiring so much paperwork. And, and during some of these discussions, it got fairly heated because uh, these people did not understand that these tax return preparers aren't trying to be difficult. They're not trying to be hard-nosed. Uh, they're simply following IRS guidance. And this dawned on me when I was looking at my own tax return uh, this past tax season. So at the time of this recording, it's the day after tax day, uh, 2024. And while I was going through my tax return, I noticed my own tax return preparers due diligence checklist for uh, some of the tax cr credits that we were applying for. So I figured I'd put together this video to uh, kind of walk through this. Certainly any new tax return preparer uh, would benefit from you know, watching this video and kind of going through this. Uh, but this is mostly for the benefit of people who might have had questions about some of these tax benefits. So uh, during this video, we're going to go through each step of this as I as I have outlined in our article and ha as the IRS has outlined on this tax uh, tax form. There are six parts to this tax form. We'll go through each of them. Uh, one by one, uh, but they cover the following tax credits. Uh, so uh, earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, which also includes the additional child tax credit or the credit for other dependents uh, for families where the uh, child is uh, older than the CTC limit, uh, the American Opportunity Tax Credit, and finally, head of household filing status. So uh, these are these are different um, tax benefits that the IRS has specifically flagged as uh, kind of high risk or uh, prone to fraudulent claims. So we'll go through this and uh, we'll talk about some of the filing requirements uh, as we go through this form. Uh, any forms or schedules that are mentioned, we'll put links to articles and videos that we created for those uh, in, in the show notes, as well as other pertinent topics. So, um, as I mentioned, only paid tax return preparers are going to complete this form. Uh, so, but it does document and it kind of helps codify that uh, the IRS has someone to hold accountable specifically the tax return preparer, uh, in the case that uh, the tax credit or the tax benefit is disallowed and the IRS determines that, you know, this could appear to have been uh, fraudulently claimed. So a, a tax return preparer has an ultimate responsibility of asking basic certain questions uh, that, uh, would uh, appear relevant or apparent to a um, normal tax return preparer uh, that, that is covering a tax return. So again, uh, this is a due diligence checklist. It is a, a requirement that your professional tax return preparer uh, must follow, whether it's your accountant or whether it's the H&R block person uh, that did your tax return. So let's go through part one, which contains the due diligence requirements. So as you can see at the top of the tax return, uh, we've got the taxpayer's information as shown on the return, their tax ID number, 
the preparer's name and their preparer tax ID number, also known as a PTIN. So all of these boxes are, for the most part, yes, no. And the correct answer is usually pretty obvious. So in uh, line one, did you complete the return based on information for the applicable tax year as provided by the taxpayer or reasonably obtained by you? So this means to the tax return preparer, uh, did you uh, use just uh, the tax information from the current year? Uh, there, there are uh, situations where a client may be eligible to claim a prior year earned income or claim a either the earned income tax credit or the additional child tax credit uh, by using prior year earned income figures. So the tax return preparer can do that as long as it meets certain requirements uh, based on treasury uh, regulations. So the, uh, the, the preparer has the responsibility of, being, of having to compute earned income for two years uh, with certain calculations. So um, all of that is outlined in the form instructions. That's a requirement for your tax return preparer. So if tax credits are claimed on the return, then did the tax return preparer complete the applicable worksheets? So this would be for the earned income tax credit, the child tax credit, the additional child tax credit, or the credit for uh, other dependents. Uh, the EIC worksheet generally is found in the form 1040, 1040 PR or 1040 SS uh, instructions. Uh, there's also schedule 8812 that covers the child tax credit, the additional child tax credit or the credit for other dependents. Uh, the AOTC, which is the American Opportunity Tax Credit, that worksheet is located in the instructions for IRS form 8863. So um, if the taxpayer uh, claimed head of household filing status and none of the tax credits, then the tax return preparer can select NA, not applicable. So um, let's, let's just go ahead and assume at the very top of part one that we're going through each of these for all of the tax benefits. Uh, this is going to force us to go through each part uh, step by step. So in line three, uh, this is the knowledge requirement. Uh, so a tax return preparer must do both of the following. Uh, interview the taxpayer, ask appropriate questions, and then document the responses to determine whether or not that taxpayer is eligible to claim these credits or head of household filing status. And then two, the tax return preparer has to review all the information to make sure that the taxpayer is able to claim the appropriate amount of the credit or the filing status, and then they have to calculate that credit. So um, a tax return preparer has the obligation to, quote, not use information that you know or have reason to know is incorrect. So if you as a tax uh, payer walk into your person's office and you give them a bunch of paperwork and some of it looks inconsistent with the IRS guidance, this might be the reason why your tax return preparer is asking additional questions. Uh, again, generally speaking, a tax return preparer uh, can use information that's provided. However, when it comes to these tax benefits, they are required to ask uh, certain questions. Uh, so, uh, According to the form instructions, quote, a tax return preparer may not ignore the implications of information provided to or known by you, and you must make reasonable inquiries if a reasonable and well-informed tax return preparer, knowledgeable in the law, would conclude that the information provided appears to be incorrect, inconsistent, or incomplete. So in other words, if you are the taxpayer and you present everything and it looks in order 
and everything that is requested is in is in the in the paperwork and it doesn't look misleading or incorrect then you might not have any questions uh, maybe you've been going to the same person for quite a while uh, it, so they don't need to ask questions about whether or not your qua child qualifies for the child tax credit for example uh, you know because you know they ask things like did your tax situation change from last year in which case if there is a change with your qualifying child, you would have to tell the tax return preparer. So these are, you know, basic questions that they have to run to ground if you give them information that appears off or incorrect or incomplete. Along the same lines in question four, uh, this is continuing that line of questioning. Did any information provided uh, either by the taxpayer or by a third party uh, appear to be incorrect, incomplete, or inconsistent. So if you answer no, if the tax return preparer an, uh, answers no, they can just go straight to question five. Well, let's imagine that they said yes, there's something that looked kind of off. So in that case, the tax return preparer has an obligation to make reasonable inquiries to determine the correct, complete, and consistent information. And they also have a requirement to contemporaneously document those inquiries. So the documentation should include questions asked, to whom those questions were asked, when they were asked, the information that came back, and then the impact that this information had on being able to prepare the tax return. For example, uh, if your tax preparer asks you uh, if you got a divorce in the previous year and you answer yes, you got a divorce, uh, the uh, follow on reasonable inquiry, if you're claiming a child tax credit, would be something like uh, who had custody of the child and uh, who, uh, or, you know, who did this child stay with longer uh, during the tax year because uh, the, um, you know, one of the rules is that. In a divorced situation, uh, generally speaking, the custodial parent or the parent uh, that uh, resides with the child for the majority of the tax year uh, is the one that's going to be able to claim the credit. So the, the, the tax return preparer has the obligation to keep asking some of these questions. So let's assume that your tax guy did that. The next question has to do with record retention. So uh, tax return preparer has to keep all the documentation uh, referred to here in question 4B, a completed copy of the form 8867, which is that due diligence checklist, any worksheets, uh, and a record of how, when, and whom the information that was used to prepare all this was uh, obtained, as well as any documents that that you provide them uh, that that you relied on to determine whether or not you were eligible so they would list these documents like let's say divorce decree stating child living arrangements Uh, let's imagine that uh, you're claiming uh, certain benefits because you filed uh, oh let's just say um, if you had self-employment income self employment income and expense documents so whatever those documents are, this is what your tax return preparer is putting on this uh, form 80, 8867. So they, they're, they're required to retain these records for up to three years after uh, either the tax filing deadline, uh, when the tax return was actually filed, or when they gave you uh, the tax return for signature. Or if they're compiling this to give to someone else, then uh, they would uh, retain this for three years after the date that this 
that the tax return was given to the other tax preparer in case there's a, a collaboration or they're only completing part of your return. So three years after the later of any of those dates. So we do kind of go over a little bit more in depth what uh, some of these uh, required documents might look like in our article uh, based on guidance from the form instruction. So if you want more particular examples, uh, feel free to check out our article. So uh, in line six, we're going to talk about uh, the whether or not the tax return preparer has asked you as the taxpayer uh, to provide documentation to substantiate eligibility for your credit that you're claiming the head of household status or you know, whatever the tax benefit is they're re they're 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 required to ask you for uh, additional documentation in line seven uh, did you ask the taxpayer if any of these credits were disallowed or reduced in a prior year so unless there's an exception that applies if you as the taxpayer had a tax credit that was previously disallowed or reduced, uh, then uh, you would need to file IRS Form 8862, which specifically requests that the IRS um, uh, gives you permission to claim certain tax credits after a disallowance. So that's, that's the tax form that you would specifically have to complete uh, if you uh, were disallowed either the EI, EIC, one of the child tax credits, or the American Opportunity Tax Credit. So, uh, and, and then if that was required, then they're, they're required to go through uh, IRS Form 8862 to make sure that you, uh, you as a taxpayer, adhere to those requirements. In line eight, uh, this is talking about self-employment uh, income. So if you are self-employed, then your tax return preparer is expected to ask certain questions to make sure that your Schedule C is complete and correct, that you're not omitting certain types of income, uh, that you're not you know, erroneously claiming tax credits or deductions that you're not entitled to. Like they have an obligation to make sure that your Schedule C is complete. So let's say that that's not applicable. If you're a wage employee, then uh, obviously uh, the Schedule C requirement is not is not there. So again, any of these tax forms and schedules that are mentioned uh, here, uh, we'll put links to those resources in the show notes. So now we're going to start going through due diligence questions for each tax benefit. In part two, this is for tax returns that are claiming the EIC, the earned income credit. In part three, this is for one of the child tax credits or the credit for other dependents. Part four is for the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Part five is the due diligence for head of household filing status. So your tax return preparer is only going to complete the parts that correspond to the boxes that are checked up here above part one. So if they, they've only checked the head of household, then they would only complete part five. So in part two, we're gonna talk about the earned income credit. Uh, again, uh, this is probably one of the uh, most fraudulently claimed tax credits that the IRS deals with. So uh, the uh, tax return preparers have an additional uh, burden to make sure that you are eligible to claim uh, either for the number of qualifying children that you say you're claiming this credit for or if you don't have a qualifying child then you sh you still need to be eligible to claim the earned income credit based on your income so if if you're claiming this and you don't have uh, a qualifying child then they would they can they they would just uh, say yes and then they would skip down to part three. So in uh, question nine B, this is asking whether or not uh, they uh, whether or not your tax return preparer asked you if the child lived with you for over half of the year, even if you supported the child for the entire year. Again, this is one of those critical rules, uh, and. If, 
if the child lived with you for less than half of the year, then you might not be the one that is able to claim that tax credit. And in that case, you would go to uh, line 9C, which is the, or the question 9C, which is uh, concerns tiebreaker rules when it comes to claiming the EIC. So the tiebreaker rules basically determine if there are two or more eligible taxpayers that could possibly claim a qualifying child uh, that meets all of the IRS criteria, then uh, only one of those can claim the EIC if they're not part of the same household. So again, unmarried parents, divorced parents, separated parents, um, you know, there may be situations where two parents can claim uh, but only one of them is going to be able to, uh, for example, if, uh, if two parents do not file a joint return together, but they both claim the child is a qualifying child, then whoever the child lived, lived with for longer during the tax year would get the, bene- would get the tax benefit. And then if they uh, determine that it's an equal amount of time, Let's just say that parents divorced during the tax year and the child spent a total of 200 days with each parent, then the tiebreaker in that situation would be whoever had the highest adjusted gross income for the year. So so your tax return preparer has the responsibility of explaining tiebreaker rules to make sure that you are the one that is able to claim that credit if it looks like someone else might be able to. So in part three, we're going to go through due diligence questions for claiming the child tax credits. Uh, So uh, each qualifying person uh, has to be a citizen, a national, or a resident of the United States. Uh, In line 11, uh, this is the tax preparer explaining that you might not uh, claim the child tax credit or the additional child tax credit Uh, If the child did not live with you for over half of the year, even if you supported the child, unless the child's custodial parent released a claim to exemption. So that would be on IRS form 8332, which we mentioned in question 12. So again, uh, there are rules about how parents would claim uh, in a divorced or separated situation uh, the applicable child tax credits. the parent who, like in the case that a non-custodial parent um, has the ability to do this because the custodial parent released their claim, then the non-custodial parent would have to attach a f- copy of Form 8332 uh, to the tax return saying, hey, I'm not the custodial parent, but the custodial parent did give me um, the uh, they cl- they release their claim to be able to uh, allow me to take that tax credit. So again, these are due diligence questions that your tax return preparer has to either know from the documentation that you've given, or they have to specifically ask you and get truthful answers from you. Uh, part four contains the due diligence questions for uh, the AOTC mainly whether or not you provided substantiation for the American Opportunity Tax Credit. Most of the time, that's as simple as a Form 1098-T from the college or other institution. If you don't have the Form 1098-T for some reason, then you can use receipts for the qualified tuition and related expenses uh, as defined in the instructions for IRS Form 8863 which is the education expenses uh, tax form. In part five, question 14 has to do with claiming head of household filing status. So the tax preparer has to determine that you were either actually unmarried or considered unmarried under IRS guidance on the last day of the tax year and that you provided more than half of the cost of keeping up a home for a qualifying person. Part six is the last part. Uh, Basically, it's the eligibility certification, rehashing a lot of this information, but basically saying, hey, from the tax preparer's perspective, 
uh, you're saying that you interviewed the taxpayer, asked appropriate questions, you documented everything, and you've reviewed the information to determine that the taxpayer is in fact eligible to claim these credits uh, or the filing status, and you've calculated the amount of those credits. And then B, you've completed this tax form truthfully and accurately, you've described everything in this checklist, uh, and C, you're, you're submitting this as required as part of the tax return, and D, you're going to keep all of these records for three years um, from the latest of the dates specified in the instructions. But you would need to keep a copy of the, or the, your tax return preparer needs to keep a copy of this completed form, any applicable worksheets, any documents that you gave them uh, that they relied on to determine your eligibility for the tax benefit, records of how, when, and from whom this information was obtained, and then any additional information that the tax preparer relied upon. This could include questions asked and your responses uh, that helped them determine that you were eligible for the credit or the filing status. So, um, and there are penalties for tax return preparers uh, that do not adhere to these tax uh, due diligence requirements. Specifically, uh, the penalty is $600 per, um, per failure. So uh, you can see that at the top of this, we're talking about uh, four different types of tax benefits, uh, four categories, so $600 for each tax benefit, not each return. Uh, so if there's a taxpayer claiming all of these and the tax uh, return preparer does not do their di due diligence, they can be held liable for up to $2,400 on that one, one tax return alone. So your tax return preparer is probably going to make sure that they do everything the IRS requires them in order to be able to click yes on this bottom statement because they are held liable by the Internal Revenue Service. And, uh, you know, so this is, this is a comprehensive form. Uh, hopefully, uh, you understand a little bit more about some of these questions that your tax return preparer may have asked you or may be asking you. So uh, that's all we have for this uh, tax form. Uh, if you want more specific information, you can check out our article. Uh, simply go to teachmepersonalfinance.com, type in IRS Form 8867, and you should see the article appear. If you like our articles, please check out our, uh, uh, please subscribe to our website. And if you like our YouTube videos, please uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. As I mentioned, we'll put links in the show notes to all the resources uh, for the forms and schedules that were mentioned here. Uh, and if there's any questions, comments, or if there's a topic that you'd like to see discussed in an upcoming video, please hit me up in the comments section. Thank you very much and have a great day.